Just a little bit of this lecture left, and then we're going to start what I would technically call part two. This is, this is like video one slash 1.2, I don't know what it is. But, and we he just talked about, this was just a review, the compartmentalization, and it's really important to keep things in check as we go along. And what I wanted to remind everyone, first of all, is, I mean, yes, you're interesting if you're a botanist, you're agrarian, but I, I, I'll never ask you about plant plant cells, so you can ignore that one. But we had we were talking about animal cells in particular. In fact, in the cytosol, um, we have what's well, not on here, but glycolysis was occurring in the cytosol. Gluconeogenesis is one of the tricky ones because it has part in the cytosol and part where else? What other part of the cell? Mitochondria, matrix in particular. <clears throat> Citric acid cycle takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. Now, technically, succinate dehydrogenase is, a, is located in the membrane, the inner membrane. Beta oxidation is a mitochondrial matrix, and so you start putting things together. But with respect to fatty acids, for the most part, we're talking about fatty acid, general fatty acid synthesis occurs in the cytosol, whereas beta oxidation was within the mitochondria. Okay, now remember we can only go up to 16 carbons with fatty acid synthase, and we're talking about saturated fats here. We're not doing specialty fats yet. And, well, in early stages of sterols, it's also in the cytosol. But for the fatty acid elongation, after it gets to a certain point, it can occur in the mitochondria. And in particular, here in the ER, we're talking about some of the elongation and the specialization I don't think your book calls it that, but that's my word for it, where they do desaturated, which is a fancy way. What are they putting in if they're desaturating it? Double bonds, okay? And remember, the naturally occurring ones are all cis, the cis double bonds. You're also, you can make phospholipids and things like that that's occurring in the ER. Okay, which back whenever I was at University of Michigan Medical School, uh, the way that the program that I was in, the cohort that I was in for the doctorate, we had to do, instead of having qualifying exams, we had to do prelims. And so you had to have a committee, you had to write like a proposal and defend your proposal and have like an oral exam, which can be a doozy in places. Like my, my oral exam at Duke lasted for hours. The oral exam at Michigan, my committee voted to put a specific timeline on it. But what I was gonna say is, you got to choose, in a way, who was on your committee. And you could pick certain people and <laughs> the, the, and you can also specifically say who you do not want to make. Because there's once in a while you, there are people out there that just are not nice. You know they're not happy with life. They need Jesus. Okay, but that's beside the point. But what I was going to say was there's this one person. In fact, at the time he was the depart, department chair for one of the departments here in the hospital. But almost everybody wanted him on the committee because. First of all, he had been in a rock band in the 60s, so he's kind of that hippie, everything is love and peace and cool groove. And he kind of looked like a skinny version of Tiny Tim. Not Tiny, well, Tiny Tim, not, 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 not the Dickensian Tiny Tim, but the one from that tiptoed through the tulips with the ukulele. But, um, but one of the reasons why is he, his primary focus was on cell biology, and he loved compartmentalization. If he would always ask you some type of question that was kind of, I don't know, hypothetical, theoretical kind of thing, and if you could type to compartmentalization, he's like, cool, that's awesome. <laughs> so that's like, he was on my committee. I got him on my committee. <laughs> and so I, I think he's still around. I don't know. If so, he'd be getting up there in years because he was not a spring chicken. And if you think back, I mean, if he was doing rock. Music in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. He's not speaking chicken. But, <laughs> um, you know, he was great. And I don't remember now why I questioned him. Actually, I do remember part of it. He's like, imagine you are the Golgi apparatus. <laughs> and then I don't remember now what I had to do with the Golgi. But I somehow worked it into compartmentalization. He's like, cool. Yes. Yes. So, but no, he, he, he was like that. Imagine you are the Golgi, the late Golgi network. <laughs> why do you suppose? So, that's why every time I see these kind of compartmentalization things, I always think of that. 
that doctor because he was big on that. All right. And actually, we've already covered this part because of the fact that, you know, fatty acid synthesis, most of it occurs inside the cell. Okay. Um, it occurs in chloroplasts and plants. But once again, I, I won't ask you about plants in particular. But then we have to think about where the acetyl CoA, where the biggest pool of acetyl CoA is located. And if we're getting that from the breakdown of previous fats, then a lot of times it's, in, it's going to be in the mitochondrial matrix, okay? And so then we have to think about the fact that the process of making ATP requires ATP. I mean, process of making fatty acids requires ATP, which should make sense. We make ATP due to catabolic processes. Same thing with that's how we get NADH and FADH2 to make ATP. The anabolic processes to build and to make things usually requires energy. So you can break down ATP. You can usually use up things like NADH and FADH2. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then we're going to talk about the transport of acetyl-CoA. Right. It is not... Some of these are players that we've seen before. Okay. So I put a circle around where the acetyl-CoA is, and there are lots of reasons why. One's from beta oxidation, one's from pyruvate, right? Pyruvate becoming acetyl-CoA from pyruvate hydrogenase complex. Um, but we have multiple ways of getting the acetyl-CoA, but it's stuck inside that mitochondrial matrix. And just like what we've seen with NADH and other things, is it can't leave that holy of holies of the cell, okay, the mitochondrial matrix. And we gotta get it outside to the side of cell in order for us to make up to 16 carbons long, you know, saturated fats. If we're doing biosynthesis of fatty acids versus, once again, we are not talking about anything that comes from your diet, exogenous, we're, we're talking about endogenous. All right, so we've gotta get this from here to here, and it can't cross through that double membrane and I like this picture. It came from your book. It may be a different number now in the current edition. But the way to do that is we utilize, there are some new players, but we also utilize what we already know about. Here we have acetyl-CoA with oxaloacetate, which can come from multiple sources as well, which we've already talked about how oxaloacetate can't go back and forth. But it's used, now we can see it's used in citric acid cycle. It's used in gluconeogenesis. It's used in the preparation work, if you want to think of it that way, to make fatty acids. So we see these common metabolites. That's why it doesn't do it justice to show just where metabolic pathways intersect each other in a two-dimensional, because usually we're talking multi-dimensional. Right? That oxaloacetate can go in three or four different ways, depending upon what your cell needs at the time. Does it need energy? Does it need to start to make fats? Does it need to start to make sugars? Things like that. But here's the citrate synthase, which what metabolic pathway have we seen this from? That's citric acid cycle. Okay. Oops, which that was the answer to that question. <laughs> citrate can, unlike acetyl-CoA, citrate can actually pass through. There's a transporter. It goes all the way out here. Now, it's just not the reversal of this. It's more complicated. So here's a new enzyme. Remember, lyases are used, you know, technically to make or break carbon-carbon, carbon-sulfur, carbon-nitrogen type of bonds, usually through the formation of double bonds, but it's not, not a requirement. So what happens here is citrate, along with coenzyme A, at the expense of an ATP, is going to go ahead and make oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. And that acetyl-CoA can then go on to fatty acid synthase. So we were successful, but now we've got to get all this back across. So one thing I want to point out is there's a pool. Like your body has, just like your body has, I shouldn't say body, the cell, the mitochondria, well, yeah, the cell, has a pool of acetyl-CoA on the inside of the mitochondria and a pool of acetyl-CoA on the outside. Because remember when we were trying to do this, with the fatty acyl groups to break it down for beta oxidation, we had the carnitine acyl transferase, trying to do something similar to that. Just like we also have a pool of NADH on the inside of the mitochondrial matrix, and we have a pool on the outside, because remember, it doesn't go back and forth across the membranes. So there are ways to do these shuttles. All right, so here we have oxaloacetate, 
an oxalic acetate at the expense of an NADH. Because remember, we're only doing this whenever we already have lots of energy. You're only going to make fats to, for fatty acid synthesis typically whenever you already have lots of energy because otherwise you'd be breaking them down. So we're going to take an NADH, making NAD, and go from oxalic acetate to malate. So what enzyme does that? That's malate. Whoops. That is malate dehydrogenase. Okay. Now from here, malate dehydrogenase, I mean the product, well, yeah, okay, nope, go on. The product malate, there are actually two possibilities. Malate, we've already seen this. Malate goes back through. It's got the malate alpha ketoglutarate transporter that we saw you know, that we've used before um, to try to get the NADH on the inside. We're just doing the reverse of that here. And then, once again, the malate can go on to make oxalic acetate as a part of the citric acid cycle or as a part of this process here. The second possibility, which we haven't seen before, which is new, is here. Nope, I lied. That you already that one. Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me make this. One of the other possibilities is malate can actually be converted to pyruvate. And this is one that's just got a special name. It's called the malic, malic enzyme. And this is one of the, only, we only have two ways to make NADPH for your body. One we discussed a long time ago in chapter 16, I think it was, which was pentose phosphate pathway. This is another way. Okay, so if you need NADPH for, you know, to work with the, the metabolism of fatty acids, you can do that here by converting malate to pyruvate um, using malic enzyme because it's going to make an NADPH. And then pyruvate, which we have seen before, the pyruvate can go through the pyruvate transporter and then come through here for pyruvate carboxylase to make oxaloacetate. Okay, what, where have we seen Pyruvate carboxylase. What metabolic pathway is it a part of? Pardon? Gluconeogenesis. So this is actually one way that gluconeogenesis is also related to fatty acid synthesis. Not directly, but it links the two. Yeah, because then from oxal if you're doing gluconeogenesis, the oxaloacetate is ultimately used to make glucose. If we're trying to make fatty acids, then the oxaloacetate is utilized really with just the shuttling of trying to get that, what had been acetyl-CoA here, to there. The coenzyme A itself does not move. It's the acetyl group that does. See, coenzyme A stays there. Coenzyme A stays out on the outside. <clears throat> so it's an ingenious way to interrelate multiple metabolic pathways which, so we don't have to have a unique enzyme for every single step inside your body. You can utilize, be more um, efficient, so to speak. Okay. All right. All right, so this is just, these were questions to myself or you for that, but we answered all these. Okay, regulation. So this is where, oh, whoops. That's where we're gonna end this part and start the next big segment. So this is how it's regulated. And I really want you to start to understand why it makes sense. Or, or, or perhaps you already understand why it makes sense. <clears throat> so the regulatory portions of this the two steps really are citrate lyase and then that acetyl-CoA carboxylase. In particular, why the hormones involved make sense for either activating it or deactivating it. <clears throat> I'm actually going to start not with the hormone, but with this. <laughs> Palmitoyl-CoA inhibits this whole process, which makes sense. Because if you have lots of this fatty acid, why do you need to make more? You don't. Okay, so that one's the one should make perfectly logical sense. This is why it's gonna it's gonna stay. We have enough. We don't need to make any more. Okay. 
citrate actually activates this process. This one's maybe not as obvious, but we've seen citrate activate things before, just once or twice. Um, but what, under what conditions do you have lots and lots of citrate? Yeah, there's lots of pyruvate, lots of acyl CoA, and we have those and lots of citrate because under what conditions, just broadly speaking, do we already have lots of energy or do we not have much energy? We have lots of energy. It's starting to back up. Why keep on doing the citric acid cycle if you've already got plenty of ATP? So then some of these metabolites like citrate, acetyl CoA, things will start to back up. You get lots of it. And so it actually activates this process and says, okay, let's start to store those fats. We're going to start making fat, putting it away in the adipocytes. Next, I wanted to point out epinephrine, which epinephrine is also called adrenaline. So will adrenaline or epinephrine, is it going to turn on or turn off fatty acid synthesis? Turn it off. Why does it make sense if you need adrenaline or if you're under the conditions for adrenaline, it's going to turn off fatty acid synthesis? You need as much energy as possible to run from that bear. Once again, my disclaimer, you run down, downhill from bears. Okay, but yes. So don't use uh, energy to make fats. You're going to be wanting to break them down and get as much ATP and stuff to get away from whatever it is that's threatening your life. <clears throat> so that one also should make logical sense. And it doesn't matter if we start with insulin or glucagon, because remember, those are antagonistic hormones. So who, you rather want to talk about insulin or glucagon? Glucagon. This is the one that people get confused all the time. A lot of times people call it glycogen. I mean, that's stored sugar. Or I've, glycine, I mean, you know, because it's, it's glucagon. Or glucose, but it's not glucose. It's glucagon. It's a hormone. When do we have glucagon? Is it during, under what conditions does glucagon get turned on? Low, Low blood sugar. Okay, so why does it make sense it's going to inhibit fatty acid synthesis if you have low blood sugar? Break down it. Right, you're going to need to break it down. That means usually under those instances you need, you need energy, right? Even fasting, you're between meals. It's been a long time since you have eaten the night before and you haven't had breakfast yet. Glucagon is going to be up increased, and so it's going to say, don't be making fats. We're going to want to break them down. We're going to break down sugars. We're going to, you know, or not break down sugars. We're going to break down things to try to make glucose for your brain. Okay. Whereas insulin, on the other hand, when do you have insulin? You just ate that, Snickers. Okay, you know, you have high sugar, and so therefore it makes sense it should start to turn on this process because if you have too much sugar, then you can start to make fats and store it for later on. Okay, so that's why if you just kind of break these down and start to try to rationalize them, maybe it kind of can help um, understand why you need to either turn on or turn off processes. Are there any questions over this? Anything? Alrighty.